in just about a month and a half, or if you use maybe round up two months, uh, baptized members will observe the annual memorial of the willing suffering and death of Jesus Christ. The new covenant Passover is a reminder that each member of the body of Christ has been invited into an eternal relationship with the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? For what purpose? To have eternal life, there came to give eternal life, and to have a spiritual relationship. Spiritual relationship. Jesus expressed this himself in John 17, 3, and said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we see here eternal life and to know, to know. It means to have a relationship with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. The new covenant symbols of the bread represents the body of Christ and the wine represents the blood that was shed for the cleansing from sin and redeeming us to God. The symbols of the bread and wine reflect the type of relationship that begins, that begins for each member that is, in, that is in Christ through the new covenant. Let's read in Hebrews 9 and see that the shed blood of Christ and the connection to the promise of the eternal inheritance representing the relationship that comes with eternal life. In Hebrews 9, 14, Hebrews 9, 14, the writer puts in here, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The first covenant did not have the promise of eternal life or eternal inheritance. The new covenant comprises eternal life and the type of personal and very direct relationship with the Father and the Son who are willing to give and share in all things to the children of God. And that is a relationship that comes first by the means uh, through Jesus' death and the redemption of transgression to remove sin, the redemption of sin, the transgressions of sin are removed, the, the sin is totally wiped away. In the symbols of the new covenant, the bread and the wine, we understand annually, which we take the Passover annually, the depth and personal relationship that God and Christ personally extends to you. Everyone here, the personal relationship they extend to you. Each Passover is deeply meaningful and very significant as there's a reminder of God's love for you, you and I. Notice, though, I said you, because it is personal for each person, and it is personal in that we are now members of one another, of the body of Christ. We all have a relationship now through this being called into the body. In 1 Corinthians 11.29, it talks about not disturbing the Lord's body properly. And we often think about the Lord's body, but that, if you look in context, it also means the members in the Lord's body, not discerning who they are, the relationship you have with them through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. The members, the Lord's body, discerning them, appreciating who they are, your brothers and sisters, in that sense, spiritual brothers and sisters. We take Passover together as Passover. We take Passover together. Together. 
and it's about the personal relationship we have with each other, but also that comes from the Father in Christ. And we also start off with the foot washing ceremony, showing a very personal relationship we have with one another. The new covenant is often defined and understood from Jeremiah 31. I'll turn, if you want to turn there, we'll read that, Jeremiah 31, verse 33. And this is really how we define the new, the new covenant and what's different about it. Begin, we begin here. And Jeremiah was inspired to write in verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law. Sometimes people say, well, the law of Moses. No, my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I'll be their God and they shall be my people. A relationship. No more, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they, sh they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The new covenant is about a spiritual relationship that reflects something important. Both the mind and the heart are involved and engaged. The mind and the heart. The understanding comes from the mind and the desire and the emotion that comes from the heart. Both are important. Jesus characterized this relationship of the mind and the heart in a similar way when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. Samaritan woman at the well. And he declared that true worshipers will worship the Father both in truth and spirit. And these worshipers the Father seeks, these are the, the truth and spirit, these are the worshipers that the Father seeks. The new covenant symbols represent how sin is forgiven and that God remembers no more and how the relationship begins with the Father and grows into a spiritually mature relationship with the Father and Son. What Jeremiah is inspired to write is a significant statement, and why the New Testament Passover is somber, meaningful, and yet also joyous for each member of the body of Christ. We remember the sacrifice of Christ for our personal transgressions and sins to be forgiven, that then begins or brings to get us to have a spiritual relationship with the Father and Christ. The new covenant is very much relationships, relationships. And that's what we're talking about today, relationships. The relationship with the Father and Christ and with other members in the body of Christ. They're eternal. Think about it. These are eternal relationships. They're based on having no end. They go forever and ever. I always use this example. Think of a million years from now. Right Now we're sitting in the flesh, and we deal with the issues of the flesh, and time goes by, and we have daily struggles and issues. But a million years from now, think about that, and think, sitting, and you can think back and remember Remember that day in Northwest Indiana, or that day in Hinsdale, Chicago, or the day in Beloit, and maybe you were dealing with something that was challenging, or a sadness, or a trial, or, and it seems so small and, and, and far away. I mean, you'll have these, oh yeah, I remember sitting next to my friend that you've known for a long time. At this point, it'll be over a million years. And the relationship you have, the relationships we're talking about, we're having in the body of Christ, as well with the Father and the Son, are eternal, forever and ever and ever. An amazing thought to think about that. A never-ending, loving relationship of family that is possible, and that is what we commemorate annually at the Passover, how that was made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the redemption of our sins so we can begin that relationship. So the title of the message today is The Relationship Promises of the New Covenant. The Relationship Promises of the New Covenant. 
So Jesus, Jesus goes to great descriptive detail on the night of his last Passover to help us understand the depth of the relationship that the Father invites us into as part of the new covenant. The last night with his disciples, Jesus desired that his disciples would begin to understand the relationship that the Father was extending to them and the relationship that the members of the body of Christ would have with one another. When we think of, about this, we should think about it in very personal terms. Per, you know, this is you. Now, it may be possible we don't fully comprehend the degree of the relationship that is possible. Maybe we have unknowingly put limits on our relationship with God and Christ. We'll talk about that later. We put limits on a relationship with God and Christ. Maybe we've only experienced a partial aspect of the of relationship that is offered in the new covenant. I hope each of us can think about that and what limits we may have unknowingly put on the relationship with God. What limits have we put on the relationship with others in the body of Christ? Are we, are we still put limits. Oh, I'll be friendly to them to this far, this, this much. <laughs> I'll show care and concern that much. Um, you know, what limits have we put on relationships? The main purpose of the message today is for us to understand the new covenant relationship that is given to each member of the body of Christ. And then we can experience in our own lives the promises and the relationship that, that the Father and Christ specifically put in the new covenant. So let's begin by going to a passage in John, it was during the Passover time, where we see Jesus beginning to explain the very personal relationship aspect that was going to be within the new covenant. And this is the first Passover uh, in, uh, part of the earthly ministry. We see this in, Nick, in John 3.3, 3. John 3.3, 3. and we see this being introduced at the Passover time in John 3.3, 3, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus was very confused about that. But Jesus introduced, or begins to introduce, that the relationship in the new covenant is something very, very different. He uses the term born again. And it says water and spirit. And it's talking about, he's talking about a new life that begins with baptism, a new beginning with God's spirit being given. In the following Passover, the next Passover later, that year, next, uh, the year later, recorded in John 6.53, Jesus adds something more understanding. He adds more understanding. Jesus begins to reveal understanding of the new covenant symbols. In John 6.53, John 6.53, he says to them at the Passover time, Then Jesus said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food, indeed, my blood is drink, indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Very personal. In the Passover service, the bread that we take of reflects the new priority or focus that we have life. It's not just for ourselves. It's that sacrifice, as we're talking about in the sermonette. And it's for God. We've given our surrender life to God. And Christ living in us. And us in him. It says abiding in Christ. Christ in you. This is a relationship. It's a very personal relationship. And the bread and wine represent that. Represent that personal, symbolize that very personal relationship that, of, that you have with Jesus Christ. And, and and what took place so you can begin to have a relationship with the Father and with others in the body of Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 
The bread is the communion of the body of Christ. The bread is the communion of the body of Christ. We are partakers or sharers with other members in the body. Christ living in us, and we live by every word of God. Jesus, in verse 56 that we read, of John 6, we just read this, begins to share the concept of a very personal relationship of abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in you. The ideas of oneness and being one is being expressed. In the Greek word for abide means to remain or stay, to sojourn, not to depart, to continue to be present or continue with, a very, very close relationship, abiding, being with some in a very close way. We start to see that to abide in Christ and for Christ to abide in us, in you, reflects a type of close relationship and the permanent nature being established, the permanent nature. Not a short, temporary relationship, not one from a distance, not a fickle relationship, but one that continues, that's permanent and meaningful, and grows in meaningfulness and permanence. It's always permanent, eternal. This is the eternal relationship we're talking about here. The relationship that reflects a covenant or an agreement that's established or ratified by Jesus' own blood. It's very personal for Jesus Christ. Think about it. It's very, this is very personal. As his own blood was shed so the new covenant relationship could be established. That makes it very personal. And the thought, and, and, and it should be very personal for us, and as it's personal for the Father. His Son shed his blood, so he, we could have a relationship with him. Now, the closest analogy, you know, this is sometimes like, well, this is a, it's a lofty concept to think about, you know, but the closest analogy, and I think we can sort of relate to this, and it's not perfect, and I hope nobody has any issues with this analogy, uh, and it's not, but it's helped to understand how personal the relationship is with Jesus Christ and the Father through the blood that was shed that allows us to abide in him and him in us. So the closest analogy to help us understand and to help us understand this is when, I, when we hear, sometimes we, we hear about these stories of a young person who tragically dies, sadly, and then the heart of this individual is given to another person so they can live, so they can live. And you hear accounts of parents and fa other family members wanting to meet of this person, you know, that somebody's, somebody in their family, let's say a son, um, has given, has died, and their heart goes to somebody else. And they, that, the people of that family, of that son, they want to meet the recipient of the heart of their son or daughter and a bond and a relationship that occurs between that person who received the heart, the family of the one who died. I mean, it, it's, it, and, and I have an account here. Let me read this to you. It's very moving. It's from a, a lady named Marie and, and Carrie uh, from Canada. It's a little older story, but I think it's still relevant. I can use it. Um, but it helps understand, you know, help us to understand how personal it is for Jesus Christ. His blood was shared so he could live in us and us in him. Marie lost her, her son Darcy in June 2002 when he was just 37 years old. She never could have imagined the special relationship she would later build with the woman who received Darcy's heart through organ donation. Carrie's life also completely changed that day as she became the lucky heart recipient of Darcy's selfless gift. Carrie had been on the transplant list for seven years after being diagnosed with heart failure. And this new heart meant a second chance at life for her. It's been so meaningful to me to be able to share with you how I lived my life as a result of Darcy's heart, said Carrie. Carrie is proud to call Marie, Darcy's mom, her second mom. Darcy lives on in me, and I have never forgotten that if we weren't for this heart, I would not have lived. The traveling, the friends, the life experiences, the work, just everything that I've done is because of this gift, shares Carrie as she wipes away tears. In this account, the family of the heart donor and the recipient feels bonded 
and the heart is providing a life and purpose for the recipient of the heart. Even more, even more significant is Christ's blood that he's willing to shed so you and I can have life, life with a capital L, that makes Christ and the Father very personally bonded and connected to you. Christ said, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. And the relationship is very personal based on Christ giving his life, his life, that we could have eternal life and a relationship based on the Son of God giving his life for you and me. In the final Passover of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus made many reassuring statements to help disciples to understand the relationship of the new covenant with the Passover coming shortly. Let's review the statements made by Jesus Christ. When we read these at Passover, there's, there's so much packed in to what we read. We may not always fully appreciate each statement that Jesus himself makes when we go through this. We might not notice the fullness of the relationship that God has called you into. Here are some of the statements Jesus made on the night of Passover, and when stated together, each of us, I believe, will find it quite helpful to help us understand what Christ is doing, the relationship he intends to have, the Father intends to have you. He said, love one another as I have loved you. He loved them to the end. He washed their feet. He said he would prepare a place for them. He would come again and receive them to himself. He said, what you ask in my name, that I will do. He said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. He said that they may be perfect in one. And he repeated, as the Father loved me, I also will love you. He said, I call you friends. He said, greater love has no one than this and to lay down his life for his friends. He said, I have chosen you. We put these statements together. We're talk, we see it. We're talking about a very close and personal relationship that Christ and the Father are desiring to have with you. Very close. That's what the relationship is meant to be, close. They're desiring to have this very close relationship with each person in the body of Christ. For the remainder of the message, I'd like to take these statements and further describe the relationship that God is building with each of us in the new covenant relationship, the new covenant. The first one I'd like to review is the statement that Jesus made in John 15, 16. John 15, 16, where Jesus said, I have chosen you. I have chosen you. He says, in John 15, 16, if you can turn there, I'll read it for you. John 15, 16, Jesus Christ said to his disciples, you do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus is saying, I chose you. It's a very meaningful statement. I chose you. Deep down, deep down, if we're honest, I think most individuals have a very emotional aspect of being appreciated and to be chosen for something. And also, maybe some pain when not chosen. <laughs> maybe we relate to that more, not chosen. Some of us, as an example, you know, this is a very basic example, but I think we all can relate to it, can experience this in the playground. You know, when, and we're choosing up teams, and two people are chosen as captain, and somehow there's too many people or an odd number of people, and not everybody can be on a team. And so they start choosing teams. And the team captains are choosing everyone and looking around who they're going to choose. And if you're not a team captain, you're sitting there, I wonder if they'll choose me. And you're trying not to show any emotion. 
everybody knows you want to be chosen. And you're thinking, oh, I hope you choose me. I don't want to be the person who doesn't get chosen. And it doesn't feel very positive not to be chosen in those situations. And maybe there's other situations. Maybe, you know, you're going for a job and they tell you, well, it comes down to just you and this other person. You're like, oh, that's great. And then they choose somebody else. And that doesn't feel so great. The feeling picked, feeling chosen, uh, is, is very positive. It's a great feeling. And Jesus says, I have chosen you. I have chosen you. The word chosen is the word that is not a casual choosing, like any, mini money, mo, or something like that. It's not a casual choosing, but a deliberate action with a thought, thinking about it. You know, the word study for this word means to properly select, to choose out by a highly deliberate choice with a definite outcome. So there is a purpose for choosing. Jesus told the disciples he chose them and it had to be reassuring, especially as the years went by, as he went on to be apostle, they had to look back, he chose us. He chose us. Now, Paul uses the exact same word in Ephesians 1.3. Ephesians 1.3. You can turn there. We'll read a few verses. Ephesians 1.3. Ephesians 1.3. Paul writes to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us. You can put your name in there. He chose you. In him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption or sonship, as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. God has chosen, and he's predestined those who are in the body of Christ, or simply as Ephesians states many times, in him. In him he chose, in Christ. He's chosen for a purpose, similar to what he told the disciples. The night of Passover, he chose the disciples. He's chosen you. He chose you. He says, he said, but I, he said, I, but I chose, and Jesus said to the disciples, I, but I choose you and appoint you that you should go and bear fruit. We see, this, we see a similar idea in Ephesians, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Being holy and without blame. That's bearing fruit. How we grow, we bearing fruit, which starts with the remission and cleansing from sin through the blood of Jesus, and then we're to bear fruit and be holy. Be holy, bear fruit and be holy. God chose us not because of who or what we are in the flesh. And Paul addresses that with the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, he's telling them, you know, he, God's not choosing you because you're the wise of the world. But when he chose you, It would be to glorify the Lord and through God's power of the Holy Spirit living in us in the relationship of you abiding in Christ and bearing fruit and becoming holy as God is holy. God chose you for an everlasting relationship. Everlasting, eternal relationship to be chosen is a very reassuring statement by Christ and one that provides confidence in his relationship that God has with you with each of us, each one of you. And we know that it's not limited. It's not eventually applied to all mankind. But from this statement that Jesus makes, it gives us meaning. Let's look at another statement Jesus made that night on his last Passover of his ministry. He said, I call you friends. I call you friends. I call you friends. Disciples had viewed Jesus Christ as Lord and Master, teacher. But Jesus shares something very personal or on Passover night, a different type of relationship he would have with his disciples. Now, let me just say, the apostles referred, you always see them ongoing in the writings, referring to Jesus as Lord and Master or servant of Jesus Christ. Even the half-brother of Jesus, James, 
refers to Jesus as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ with the right and appropriate respect of who Jesus Christ is in our lives, Lord and Master. We should keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. But keeping that in mind, Jesus did want the disciples to understand an aspect of the relationship that he would include them into. Jesus shares something very personal, something that is very important for the disciples to hear just before Jesus gives his life for them. He tells them, I call you friends, a beloved and dear friend. Let's look at this in full context in John 15. John 15, and we'll start in verse 13. John 15, verse 13. Jesus said in John 15, verse 13, to his disciples, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So Jesus Christ is making known, is letting his disciples know that there's more to the relationship than a disciple or servant. It doesn't go away. That's an aspect of the relationship, but there's also another aspect, friendship. Friendship is added to the relationship, friendships. All importantly, Christ would always be their Lord and Savior. He's always going to be our Lord and Savior. Lord and Master, Savior, and that's what we refer to Jesus Christ as. But he says, I will be your friend. One that brings you into the plan, the thinking, what the Father and I are planning, what we're going to do, what we're, trying, what we're building, what the eternal plan is, the kingdom of God. We're bringing you in. <laughs> And Jesus did the most incredible thing, which was to lay down his life for his friends. And they would understand the significance of that over the next few days. Jesus continues to show that dimension of that relationship after he was resurrected, showing the aspect of friend, friendship in the relationship, the friendship. In John 21, and this is after Jesus Christ was resurrected, And we see in John 21, verse, we'll start in verse 11. And the disciples are out fishing. John 21, verse 15. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish. And we're breaking into the story here. Uh, Christ told them where this man they realized was later was Christ. Jesus told them where to cast the net. And 153, and although there were so many, The net was not broken. Yet Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. And then verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Here Jesus is doing a very friend type thing. His friends are out fishing. And he knows they're going to be hungry, and they need food, and they're going to enjoy some food. He makes them breakfast. He says, come and eat. And one of the most enjoyable things we can ever do is sit down with good friends and share a meal. To share a meal with good friends. Jesus is doing the same thing here. Come, have some breakfast. Let's talk. Let's be together. Let's share a meal. He even had the bread ready. It means he had to have some very fresh bread made over fire. If you've been to the Middle East and that part of the world, and they, they still do that today, you know, they, they, make, they have dough there. It means there's some dough ready. <laughs> Quick, and, he, and, they, and they usually make the bread right in front of you oftentimes, and it's this wonderful, and he's making bread for them, and it's fresh and hot, with the, and they're sharing a meal. This is the type of relationship friends have, and they share what is on their mind and what they're thinking. Jesus continues to engage his disciples as friends as you read in Acts 1. Acts 1. And those in the Acts study on Wednesdays have heard this. But Acts 1, verse 1, 
Um, we'll start at the beginning here. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what do we see here? What do we see here? He's continued to make known to his friends, his apostles that he had chosen, what the Father is doing, what they're doing, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He's sharing more about what the kingdom of God is and what is God doing. The plan of God, the king, that's the gospel right there. The gospel that Christ came preaching is the gospel of the kingdom of God. What is that? And he's telling them more things about it so they could go out as apostles and teach the very same thing. He's, he's sharing what it is. The kingdom of God. That is what they were to preach. And Jesus is continuing to bring them the plan of God, the thinking, the, what's going to happen. He's sharing with his friends. Yes, they would always think of Jesus as their Lord and Master and Savior, just like we do. But he's communicating to them as friends, partners, sharing, a fellowshipping together. That is what friends do. John stresses this type of fellowship of sharing in 1 John, the very beginning of his epistle. 1 John 1. Let's turn to 1 John 1. 1 John, verse 1. First John 1. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Joy may be full. That you're partaking and fellowshipping with the same, He sung, as an apostle, I touched, I talked, I, understood, I know eternal life manifested, the Word of God. And He has, has it that He's declaring to me that you may also have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father and, and the Son, Jesus Christ. A wonderful beginning to an epistle of what it's all about, the relationship to Christ and the Father extending. The aged Apostle John is writing about having fellowship or partnership together with the Father and the Son. This is a dimension of the relationship that Jesus as friends is presenting to the disciples that last night, he said, I call you friends. And Jesus was the most giving of friends and showed the love of a friend that is there at all times. There's always going to be the faithful servant of God aspect to the relationship with God, but there's also the friendship, the fellowship, a partaking of the divine nature, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1 4. The divine, partaking of the divine nature. This is a very reassuring and comforting message Jesus shares with disciples on the last night of Christ's earthly ministry. He calls his disciples friends, and he calls you friends in the new covenant. Let's look at one final but very significant aspect of the relationship that Father will have with his children. This last point here, in talking about relationships, the eternal relationships that's made possible through Passover, Jesus prayed on that night that, that they may be made perfect in one. Perfect in one. Let's turn to John 17, verse 20. We see this stated. John 17, verse 20.
And here we see a prayer of Jesus Christ recorded for us for our benefit, put down by John, the Apostle John. John 17, verse 20, and he, and he says, and Jesus, Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and that the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. This is quite the remarkable statement by Jesus that we're to be one, made perfect in one. Jesus makes a similar statement in verse 11, that they may be one as we are one. This truly describes the pinnacle of the relationship with God under the new covenant, being one. And that's exactly what is meant. I used an analogy, an analogy or an example earlier let me use another one that may help us understand this in human terms. You know, it's much beyond what I'm going to give, much better. The reality of what God is intending to be one is much greater than anything that I can come up with in, in an analogy or example. But let me give you this. We are, we are to be one with God in Christ. Yet, all different personalities, everybody has a different personality, yet to be one in God, one, you have to be one. Now, what came to mind, and the best example I can think of in human terms, uh, in the human realm, and to provide a sense of how two or even more than two can demonstrate oneness. And I'm sorry if this is kind of like, seems silly to you, but let me just use this. I have multiple examples. But the first one I thought about was synchronizing diving. Synchronizing diving. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen synchronized diving, but it's quite amazing if you think about it. Two divers whose goal is to be perfectly synchronized and coming out of the, off the diving board, performing the dive, very complex dive, and entering the water at the same time in the same way, perfectly, and doing it perfectly. Now, in synchronized diving, there's two types of judges in synchronized diving. One is a technical judge who evaluates the degree of completion of their dives. Another is a synchro judge who evaluates the synchronization of the two divers. And if you've seen it, if you've seen synchronized diving, it's quite mesmerizing just watching these two individuals jumping up the diving board, and especially when they're totally in sync. And they attempt to perform a very technical dive, maybe multiple twists and turns and, and uh, flips. And they perfectly do it together, and they perfectly go into the water at the same time. And, and that's the ultimate, and at the exact same time. And it takes years, and think about it, it takes years and years of practice to be able to perform the dives that they do. And then to add into that, that they're doing it in sync with another person at the exact same time. They're striving to be one in timing and technical accuracy of the dive. You know, maybe you could see the same thing in a, in a couple's ice skating. They do ice skating, and we, we often watch that at the Olympics. And, and maybe that's another option. Or maybe another example we can think about is singing in a duet or group. Those who sing have good voices say when they sing in a duet or maybe in a group, when they're totally one, perfectly in the way they're supposed to hit the notes and perfect in timing and hitting the music, that it's an unbelievable feeling musicians get. They perfectly are in sync, and everybody's together. And, and, they, and people that have the ability to sing and sing together with others, you know, they energize. They talk about how energizing it is to be in sync with one, a group of people all singing together. Maybe another example is an orchestra, all playing together. Many members, but all one. We often try to go to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and it's amazing on some of the pieces that they're all playing together in oneness. And many members, all playing different instruments, and seeing them play some of the pieces when they're totally in sync, on target, playing it, it's electrifying. I mean, I'm not a musician, and even anybody 
but it just brings goosebumps to you when you see them play this incredible piece. And they're all together in this, you know, violins and violos and trombone, uh, uh, the, the, the bass section and all the parts of the orchestra, all being in oneness. And that's some examples. These are some examples of humans, what humans are capable of doing. You know, being diverse, different, but coming together to be one, in oneness. Being one is what God is. Let's see this in John 10, where Jesus makes a statement that the Jewish leaders could not comprehend. In fact, it made their heads spin. <laughs> uh, John 10, John 10, verse 30, uh, starting verse 25, John 10, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Again, we're talking about internal relationship here. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand, my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. All right, and he goes on to say some other very interesting things. But let's drop down to verse 38. He says, he goes on and says, But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. That's verse 38. I drop down to verse 38. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Notice, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Now, this really caused the Jewish leaders to spin, because they can only view God in one way, from Deuteronomy 6.4. And that's the limitation they had, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, I, the, the I, the, I, the Lord, the Lord our God, is one. I, the Lord our God, is one. And many of you know, well, that's the Shema. And it's the basis of many of the prayers of the Jews that they, they still perform. And that verse is absolutely true. But the Jewish leaders didn't have the full understanding or they had a very limited perspective. Jesus explains for those that were there, the works that the Father did were quite remarkable. Sorry, the works that Jesus did were quite remarkable. Healing the blind, healing those who were sick, multiplying bread and fish to be feed the thousands. How is this being done? Jesus said, my Father and I are one. We are united. And you might say we're synchronized to the millisecond, you might say. They're, they're one. And he said, many good works I've shown you from my Father. If you do not... Do, if you do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if, I do the, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I in him. That's verse 38. Believe the works that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I in him. They were synchronized. They were one. The works showed they were, how they were being executed. The works being done by the Father, the power of the Father, through Jesus Christ. And that's what God is ultimately doing. He's building a family of one, a family of one. Individuals, yet one. The 12 disciples were all different personalities, diverse political views, economic backgrounds, yet he said they were, were to be one. They would be one. Jesus restated this to the disciples in John, in John 14, 9 on the night of Passover. So another statement. John 14, if you want to turn there, verse 9, he restates this oneness, that they're, they're, they are to be one. John 14, 9, Jesus said to them, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. 
And he's trying to have these disciples understand what this oneness is and the Father working in him and, and being one. The Father and the Son are one in the plan, the actions, the purpose, the goals, the strategy, the outcomes, everything, they are one. One in love. The works that Jesus did was the evidence of the unity and the oneness of the Father and Jesus had with the Martha, the oneness. Going back to this very, you know, not the best example, but the best I can come up with, for synchronized divers to do well, they have to have a relationship of cooperation and willingness to have unity to be successful. You know, one diver might prefer to have slightly longer pause before going in, into a turn, or, but the other diver has to adjust or they'll be out of sync. They have to work it out. They have to figure out how they're going to do it together. Each diver in the situation is responsible for their own actions. They're individuals. The other diver uh, you know, does, has to execute in the same way. They have to do the jump, the turn, the entry into the water. And each, each diver is responsible for their own actions, but they're unified. They have to be together. They have to be one, and that implies a relationship. And to get a good score, they have to go together. And the more they are one, the more perfect their score will be. It takes time of trust, of working together, dependable, having a dependable relationship, and often years of working together. And that's really what we're talking about, relationship with Jesus Christ for eternity, building that trust, being one. Jesus said that the Father said to the Father that his disciples be made perfect in one. That requires a very committed relationship with the Father and Christ. A very intimate relationship. Very intimate. In John 14, 23, John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will, will love him. And we, together, we will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home with him. Now this is a reflection or description of being one. The father and the son making their home in you. Think about it. That's very personal. That's a relationship. It might be, you know, think about how sometimes we have very good friends. We know them well. And, they, and we're... They, they come to our house, we're staying, and you open, open up your house. And you might have a really good relationship with them, maybe family. And you say something like, well, make yourself at home. Anything in the fridge is yours, whatever you want, make yourself at home. Now, at the beginning, I talked about the limits sometimes you put on the relationship with God and Jesus Christ. In this example, of Jesus Christ making their home in you, inviting them to, into your home, into your life, do you really say the same thing? Make yourself at home. Whatever's in the fridge is yours. Whatever you want to do, you know, make yourself at home. In fact, we might want to say things like, in fact, if you want to make a change to the furniture, go ahead. <laughs> Not a problem. In this analogy, you know, that Christ uses in making their home in us, you know, maybe we invite them in to our, in our, into our lives, into our, into our lives, both of them. But maybe, and we say, make yourself at home. Uh, my home is your home. But in reality, we say that, but there's a few doors that are still locked. You can't go in there. You're just not quite ready to let Jesus Christ go in there, or God the Father go in there in that room. We're not, and we, know, and we, know, we, we really think about it, we're like, we're not letting anybody in there, right? There's these rooms in our house, these rooms in our, in our lives, things we need to address. No one's getting in there. That is off limits. But really what we're talking about is letting Jesus Christ and Father live in you, and, and they can go anywhere they want. They can move the furniture around. Hey, you know, maybe we need to, pay, you know, we need to change some things here. You can go, they can go any room they want. Maybe in this way, it helps us think about how we have limited, limited the relationship we have with the Father and Jesus Christ. You come in so far, and we let them, but then 
There's certain areas we're not willing to go. We don't want them to go. Are some of the doors still locked in our homes? We let them in the front door, maybe in the living room only. But consider this analogy. It's a good analogy to think about. That in our own lives and relationship with God, maybe we've limited God with some locked rooms that no one goes into, and not even God and Jesus Christ, who have everything in your best interest for you. They've, lived, they've given everything to you, but we're still limiting, limiting that relationship in that sense. Jesus said, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is a relationship that God and Christ offer, an eternal relationship through the new covenant. Be made perfect in one is the relationship that God is building in each of us, with each of us. It's an incredible statement that takes God's spirit and the understanding of the mind of Christ and being one in purpose for the Father to be made perfect in one. It's the pinnacle of the relationship that Jesus was reassuring his disciples would take, that Jesus and the Father are committed to for eternity. Remember, we're talking about eternal life here, forever and ever and ever. The relationship is forever. The annual Passover is a reminder of the willing death of Jesus Christ. It's also the reminder of the very reassuring words of the very deep and committed relationship that God is building for eternity with each one of his children. The new covenant established through the depth of Jesus Christ and begins an eternal relationship with God and his family. Let's all be encouraged, energized, and willing to continue to build and strengthen and trust completely the relationship that God has committed to have with each one of us, each one of us. So I hope this has been helpful as you begin to think about and prepare for the upcoming Holy Days and Passover.